Good morning and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, uh, we are very uh, pleased to uh, invite uh, two famous professors from uh, UCL and from Tsinghua to give us uh, lectures. In fact, it's the uh, last joint lectures uh, hosted by UCL and Tsinghua. The first uh, professor uh, is Professor Mike Davis. Uh, who is the founding dean of the Department of Environment uh, Engineer, Science and Engineering, a very famous professor in UK. And the second professor is Professor Yin Ping Zhang from Tsinghua University, uh, who is the chairman of the uh, Association of uh, Indoor Environment uh, Quality and Control. So uh, thank you for your uh, support. And now, uh, let's uh, ask uh, Assistant Professor uh, Tang Hao, uh, Dr. Tang Hao, to uh, moderate the lectures. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome to the International Seminar on Low Carbon, Smart and Healthy Building co-hosted by Tsinghua University and the University College London. Today will be the fourth and the final seminar in this series. Uh, my name is Hao Tang and I'm a postdoc at Tsinghua University. I will be serving as your moderator today. Today we will have two brilliant talks given by Professor Mike Davis from UCL and by Professor Yinping Zhang from Tsinghua University. After each panel, there will be a 10 minutes for any questions from audience. Right now, I will briefly introduce our first speaker, Professor Mike Davis from the Department of Building Physics and the Environment at UCL. His research interests lie in the provision of uh, healthy and comfortable building, built environments in the context of a changing climate. The outputs of his work have impacted on a range of relevant K national and international policy, and he's a member of the UK Climate Change Committee. He was a founding director of UCL Institute of Environmental Design and Engineering, and is director of the multidisciplinary complex built environment systems groups. He leads a strategic program of uh, research aimed at informing the scientific understanding of the systematic uh, nature of a sustainable built environment. For over a decade, he has led an extensive program of research funded on intimate collaboration with researchers from health and other disciplines, which has sought to understand the complex relationship between the built environment and the human being. Next, please welcome Professor Matt Davis who will be speaking to us on complex urban systems for sustainability and health. Hello there, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm just going to see if I can uh, share my screen. Can I just check that you can now see my screen, please, and that you can hear me, okay? Okay, very Professor, okay, we can see your slides. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, well, again, thank you very much for the very kind invitation to speak to you uh, today. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, about a particular project, the Complex Urban Systems for Sustainability and Health Project, or CUSH for short. I'll start off with a brief introduction as to provide some context for why we think a project such as Kush is so important uh, and, and, and timely. And then I'll give some uh, details, a little bit of background to the, to the project itself. I'll spend a few minutes speaking about the program theory for the project, which sets out the actions that we are taking and have taken in the project and the changes that we expect to see as a result of those actions. And then I'll provide a few brief examples of some of the work that we've undertaken in the, in the project. Some, an example from London and an example from Kasumu in Kenya. And if I have time, I'll also mention uh, briefly uh, some work in relation to overheating in care homes 
uh, in the UK, which is a uh, Kush project has provided some input into. Uh, I'll finish off with just uh, a few uh, minutes of reflection on the type of project that Kush is and how quickly we might expect such a project to be able to impact on policy. And then I'll just summarize briefly uh, at the end. So as an introduction, just some context then, as I said, as to why we think that the, a project such as Kush is so important. By almost any objective measure, success in meeting key environmental and associated health challenges has at best been limited. Uh, the climate system is just one of nine planetary boundaries that are in danger of being transgressed with, with serious implications for all countries. But there are potential substantial benefits from climate action, not only because of the benefit of reducing future impacts of climate change, but also because of the more immediate co-benefits for health of the transition to a low carbon economy. And there is abundant evidence that the future of health and natural systems in the Anthropocene will be decided by decisions on urban development. Yet opportunities to grasp potential multiple benefits associated with policy and infrastructure investments are poorly understood and frequently overlooked. So Cush aims to assess opportunities to implement policies and interventions linking health and environmental sustainability with a particular emphasis on climate change mitigation. So Cush is a five-year research project, a little bit more longer than that, that's funded by a, a large charity based in the UK, the Wellcome Trust, and it will, it's scheduled to end uh, in October 2023. And its aim is to support cities in bringing about these city-wide, these large-scale uh, and rapid changes with the aim of transforming environmental quality, sustainability, population health, and health equity. It's a large multi-partner consortium with six partner cities. It has three main components to it, three main building blocks. First is the hope that we've assembled a team that's uh, able to provide cutting edge scientific evidence. Secondly, this framework of participatory research, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. It's, it's great to have this cutting edge scientific evidence available but it may only be of academic interest if it's not made accessible to policymakers who can uh, hopefully use it to inform decisions about policy and about the implementation of policy. And the third main strand in the project is the recognition that cities are complex systems. And so we need a formalized approach to dealing with that complexity. So that's, that's the kind of overview of Cush, if you like. I mentioned that the Kush team is a large one. It's a large uh, international team. So we have many partners throughout the world, including in China. And we are working very closely with six partner cities. And these uh, partner cities we are working with because of the matrix of different opportunities and challenges presented in those cities. We have two cities in Europe, London and Wren, two cities in Kenya, Nairobi and Kasumu, and two cities in China, Beijing and Ningbo. And with contrasting scales, so uh, a, a larger and a relatively smaller city in each of those contexts, although of course Ningbo is still very big, um, with different sets of environmental challenges and different types of governments and different opportunities for action in these different settings. So it, a, a very broad, uh, spectrum of cities and, and challenges selected and deliberately chosen to uh, enable us to explore these very interesting uh, diverse range of uh, issues. So we within Kush, we are, are addressing both local environmental uh, imperatives. So on the left, there is a picture of uh, Nairobi with the, the very low income informal settlements in the foreground and the relatively wealthy areas in the background. So we're addressing the local environmental challenges that come uh, with, 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 with such as this, but we're also addressing global challenges, as I mentioned, relating to climate change uh, and uh, the, the challenges that, that that brings. So we are addressing these really three interlinked challenges to building sustainable cities reducing the environmental footprint of those cities, increasing resilience to environmental change, and thirdly and finally, 
promoting and protecting health. And here's just a, a diagram to kind of set the scene to, um, this is from some work we did uh, many years ago that was published in the, in the Lancet and was led by Yvonne Riding, um, Shaping Cities for Health, Complexity and the Planning of Urban Environments in the 21st Century. And this diagram tried to set down these multiple connections um, between health outcomes and the urban environment. So I won't talk through this uh, in great detail, but just to show the multiple ways in which the uh, urban environment via these connected routes can have impact on chronic disease, mental health, uh, health impacts via injury and violence, but also via infectious disease. So this, this kind of complexity is the context for the work of Koch and this interconnected nature uh, within the urban environments. So to try to um, formalize our approach and to try to think carefully about how to organize such a large program as Kush, we developed a program theory, which has two main components, an action model and a change model. So the action model describes the things that we do that we hope will lead to improved city health and sustainability. The change model are the broader things that we hope will change as a result of what we do via the, our series of actions. And so we produced what we thought was a pragmatic program theory over quite a long period, uh, almost two years it took to, from start to finish to develop this program theory, where we brought together all the people involved in Kush, at multiple discussions, lots of iterations, and finally agreed across this very multidisciplinary project what we thought the project was about, how it would work, and what we thought would change as a result of the project being undertaken. There's a lot of detail on this slide, uh, so I, I won't go through it in great detail, but on the left, you can see the action model that I mentioned, and on the right, the change model of the Kush uh, project, which involves this transdisciplinary approach to working, bringing together all of these disciplines and a wide variety of stakeholders in the cities to co-produce and to work together in undertaking the project. So you can see the sort of actions that we uh, have planned and indeed have now undertaken largely uh, um, as the project has progressed. So it begins very importantly by building relationships and some degree of consensus in the cities. And this, as we all know, can be a very time consuming and uh, intensive process. We then, Hopefully, once we have established uh, a set of useful and working relationships in the city, we then continue to try to understand the context of that particular city. And as I mentioned, we have this very broad range of cities that we're working with to try to explore these multiple uh, issues in different settings. We then work to synthesize what evidence is available, both from the city and also globally in relation to sustainability and health. And then we look at what the possible objectives of that city might be all the time trying to ensure that we have these very ambitious, large scale and rapid uh, ambitions for the, for the cities. We're then within the Kush project, we have uh, been building and using a whole series of models and I'll describe uh, one or two of them today uh, and give some examples of those. And then we're able to then test different scenarios uh, for that uh, city uh, as to how different policies uh, might impact on the sustainability and health uh, outcomes in that city. Um, we then, as we move towards these later stages, we're then um, trying to ensure that this uh, scientific evidence that we've developed in this working with the cities then leads to uh, uh, appropriate policies and implement implementation plans, and then moving towards the actual implementation of those. So with the ultimate end goal of improvements in sustainability and health in the city. And you can see that with all these different steps have different um, feed forward and feedback connections. In the change model, as I said, very importantly, noting this uh, transdisciplinary approach to working across multiple disciplines and multiple sets of stakeholders, we hope that we will see changes in people, processes, and policy practice and research. So it isn't just this one end goal of a city having these improvements in sustainability and health, and that's the only uh, possible outcome, I guess, against which we can evaluate 
uh, the success or not of the project, we have these multiple uh, steps against which we can assess and evaluate uh, how successful or not the project has been. And we are now, of course, in the process of uh, continuing the evaluation of the uh, Kush project via a, an evaluation framework, which draws in is based on the uh, policy, the, the, the program theory. So just a reminder then, these are the three main components of Kush, this provision of cutting edge scientific evidence and trying to understand the value of that or not to policymakers in developing effective policies and implementing them. Acknowledging that there has to be this framework of participatory research, engaging those policymakers in the project right from the beginning of co-producing the uh, and, and, and co-creating the work, but then co-producing it as we move through the project. And thirdly, this uh, acknowledgement of the complexity of the, uh, the of the issues involved. And I just want to spend one minute, maybe just talking about these last two bullet points. Uh, and firstly, why we think that uh, a systems thinking approach is so uh, important. If we take the example of uh, trying to improve the energy efficiency of the housing stock in countries uh, because of uh, issues related to climate change, we want to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with uh, housing stocks for both heating and cooling. If we have just a very narrow focus on those issues of energy efficiency, then we have some evidence now that that's very unlikely to lead to successful outcomes. And there was an example of was the Green Deal many years ago in the UK was the flagship policy, which failed to produce the desired outcomes. There was very little uptake across uh, in the population um, of these energy efficiency interventions. And we and others uh, tried to think about why that might have been the case. Why were these policies not successful? And in part, we believe it was because they failed to take account of these, and in this case, these, these multiple interconnections and connections with other parts of this, the housing system. So changes that you made to the energy efficiency of a dwelling can have important impacts on the ventilation and therefore the indoor air quality, the indoor environmental quality uh, of those dwellings. It can be a positive impact, but it can also be negative. Uh, it can have impacts uh, in relation to uh, community connection, land ownership, the values of the, of the homes, the, 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 the indoor temperatures and the affordability of the housing. So we argue that it's necessary to understand this wider complex system in order to develop effective policies to achieve success in this particular area. And in doing so, by having this integrated systems-based approach, you increase the chances of that particular policy succeeding. But if you carefully design it, you can really try to maximize the positive co-benefits that might happen as a result of that policy. Uh, and you also minimize the chances of unexpected, unintended consequences, such as this impact on uh, air quality being negative, for example. And you therefore have a, a much better grasp on the, the trade-offs associated with the policy. So that's really in part why we felt it was so important to incorporate this systems thinking approach in the project. And this is just one example of one of the kind of sectors as to why we thought it was so important. So the, if you remember out of the three bullet points, I mentioned this participatory framework. So within Kush, we have really tried very hard to engage with policymakers to make sure, to try to make sure that the work, the research that we're doing is relevant and can be um, used in policy development and has that impact. So alongside the systems thinking, we uh, are always trying to work in close engagement and participation with uh, stakeholders uh, in the inner cities. And we have hold, held a whole series of workshops such as this. I think this was in uh, Nairobi, where we hold these workshops. We get people to talk about uh, what their hopes and fears are in relation to any uh, policy. And we draw these causal uh, maps um, of the, uh, the issues involved, and then combine all of these different uh, causal maps into one larger picture that hopefully contains connections uh, and uh, issues that are not necessarily in any one person's head, but as a collective group of people, uh, we can draw this, these causal maps, which enable us to try to understand better the system that we're addressing. Uh, initially, at that stage, in a qualitative uh, way, but in the final part of this is, is to where the data uh, allows us to do so, to build dynamic quantitative models of the system so that we can test 
what the likely outputs of uh, various policy options are for a whole range of criteria in relation to sustainability and health and, uh, and beyond that. So this is broadly uh, the, the uh, ways of working that we've uh, tried to establish in Kush. And with each of our partner cities, therefore, we've tried to work through uh, these various stages. So, as I mentioned, really tried to align with the city priorities, beginning these conversations about current policies and the plans and targets, and then starting to um, build tailored evidence via modeling and, and other uh, uh, methods from uh, reviews, et cetera. Um, and then holding these uh, participatory system dynamic uh, workshops to really build a systems model uh, leading to the uh, development of options for policies which look like they should be uh, promise, uh, promising outcomes for sustainability and health. And very importantly, we also uh, include this behavior change uh, component in the, in the work. And at all stage, we're evaluating how successful or not these uh, various parts of the process are. So that's the kind of background to cushion the way that we've been trying to work. I'm just gonna run through a few brief uh, examples uh, now. I think I've got about um, 15 uh, or so minutes left. The first example I want to give is the uh, development of one particular, we de we've developed many tools within, uh, within uh, the Kush project. The first one I'd want to talk to you about today is the uh, CRAFT tool and its application to London. So CRAFT stands for the Cities Rapid Assessment Framework Tool. And in its current version, the tool provides estimates of the the effects of a, a range of different policy options with regard to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, but also, and very importantly, the associated change in mortality um, that comes alongside the implementation of that policy. So for any one policy, we can try to estimate the impact on greenhouse gas emissions, but also the impact on health. And this is an example of a relatively uh, simple, but hopefully rapid and useful tool that we've developed in the project. And where it sits into this kind of, uh, process of engagement with the policymakers is that we kind of we run the, the craft tool and we get outputs and I'll show you in a second what examples of the type of outputs that we get and then following this very rapid analysis uh, using craft we then um, select a range of interventions for more detailed scrutiny of, uh, by the use of more detailed modeling approaches <clears throat> and by the workshops so an example of a, a more detailed tool is uh, MicroEnv and that's been published and that is a micro simulation uh, model uh, which provides uh, a more granular uh, and detailed look uh, at the issues raised by by craft so this is really how the craft tool works um, we work with stakeholders to identify the relevant uh, uh, policies and we're working with London <clears throat> uh, the uh, Greater London Authority uh, had a plan and already had a range of policies in mind so that provides us with a very good starting point uh, to uh, look to try, to try to understand what the uh, implication would be uh, of the implementation of these policies across buildings, transport, energy, green infrastructure, and waste. And then the craft tool then moves into an assessment of the environmental impacts of these different policies, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, as I said, but also in terms of the impact on air pollution, indoor environmental quality, so changes in a, the concentrations of a variety of uh, different pollutants, including Raybon, uh, and then also in, in transport. And that was in, in relation to the travel related phys uh, physical activity or inactivity. And so the, uh, the tool, the craft tool outputs uh, relative changes in greenhouse gas emissions, but also relative change in exposure of these uh, determinants of health as its second stage. And then the final stage is to feed these into a health impact assessment, which gives us uh, estimates of the health impacts uh, alongside the estimates of the reductions in greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So here are just some examples uh, from, from the, uh, a, a run, which looks at 10 key policies uh, in London. These are the policies here. So this e-transport system, active travel, upgrades to buildings in London, the in, uh, installation of heat pumps, heat networks, photovoltaic installations, and so on. So the different colors relate to these different policies. And then for each of those different policies, uh, the model makes estimates of the changes 
due to that policy. So the top row there is, this is the increase in travel related physical activity that we would expect to see as a result of the active travel uh, policy and so on. Um, we anticipate, uh, for example, with radon, that there actually might be an increase in the concentrations of radon if uh, buildings are upgraded from an energy efficiency point of view, but uh, the ventilation rates drop in those buildings as a result. Uh, there is the potential for these increases in radon and also in indoor particulate matter. But conversely, a reduction in the outdoor uh, component and also uh, reductions in uh, exposure to outdoor NO2, uh, outdoor uh, PM2.5. <clears throat> so, the, and, here, and here are the changes in the greenhouse gas emissions alongside changes in exposure to heat and cold. And alongside that, then, here is the estimated impact on health. And this is in the, uh, this is expressed in the avoided uh, number of deaths and decrease or increase. So most of the policies have a, a positive outcome. They re, re, the, the, the number of deaths uh, avoid, avoid is increased. So these, these are the positive outputs on the, on the right-hand side. But we can see, as I said, that there are some potentially negative impacts of these policies which uh, policymakers, we believe, should be aware of in designing their policies. So alongside the, the very positive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, generally these policies have um, positive impacts on health, but there can be instances where you see these negative uh, impacts as well. And while I mentioned radon, we had the uh, opportunity to um, do some more detailed work on radon and we uh, use a series of radon measurements that were made in um, about 470,000 UK homes um, and we by an analysis of those measurements uh, it demonstrated that the energy efficiency measures as currently been implemented um, have an adverse association with indoor uh, radon levels so uh, these energy efficiency event interventions are associated with increases in indoor radon levels it seems from that database uh, at the moment so an issue of potential concern there the second example is a very different one uh, it's uh, drawn from um, uh, our work in kenya and in uh, kasumu one of the two towns uh, that we're working with in with two cities that we're working with in kenya and it addresses this issue of uh, waste uh, generation in Kasumu. And in Kasumu, on average, around five, 500 tonnes a day is produced, of which only about 40% is collected. And the rest uh, accumulates in uh, a, very, a rather disorganised way in open pits, one skips or is burnt, for example. Um, however, the waste composition is uh, has, a, has a high percentage of organic waste in it. And so there's a valuable opportunity for recycling waste into biogas. So this part of the Kush project looked at what opportunities there might be uh, in Kasumu to reorganize the waste management system there to bring benefits for uh, both greenhouse gas emission reductions, uh, but also for health. And again, we built a, um, a system dynamics model of the system. So uh, with these different components, I won't go into great detail because I, I don't have time, but we looked at the waste collection sector the biogas sector, the landfill sector, and the scattered waste sector, and these different components in it. And we um, built a systems model acknowledging these connections between the different parts of the system. And we're able then to try to understand uh, how greenhouse gas emissions were due to uh, the production of methane from the, um, from the waste, but also from the burning, uh, could be reduced by these new strategies of producing um, biogas from the waste. Uh, which could then also has the additional co-benefit of being able to be used to replace the use of dirty fuels in households for uh, lighting and, and cooking. And these were the outputs from some of the uh, modeling work. And this is basically the, re the reduct these are the emission savings, greenhouse gas emission savings that we uh, forecast uh, up until 2035. So these are the kind of cumulative um, emission savings from these different policies. So we built a, a, cause, a, a qualitative uh, system dynamics map first, as I mentioned, and then in this case, we felt there was sufficient data to be able to build a quantitative system dynamics model. And so we use that to simulate um, the, in, well, and estimate the impact of these different policies. So households switching to biogas, a ban on burning, recycling of organic waste, and the synergy the synergistic effects between these three policies. So we were able to demonstrate the potential for very substantial 
emission savings uh, within Kasumu of these different policies. So that's the greenhouse gas emission. We were also then uh, able to make estimates of the impacts on health. So the graph on the left-hand side shows what changes we uh, uh, projected in ambient particulate matter, in this case, PM 2.5 concentrations uh, in Kasumu as a result of these policies. Kasumu is growing. It's a very rapidly growing uh, city. So this was our baseline in, in what was then 2021. The, the future baseline uh, had higher uh, concentrations because of the uh, increases in uh, population. And we were able to demonstrate that via the, these different interventions, we were able to reduce those PM 2.5 concentrations quite substantially. Um, and also, therefore, calculate the cumulative life, saves, life years saved compared to the baseline um, as a result of these different interventions. So a quite substantial number of life years saved. I'd, well, I mentioned uh, Kisumu, I'll just mention another piece of work that we did in Nairobi, again, looking at, uh, uh, this was uh, lo looking at household air pollution in Nairobi slums. And we used a uh, system dynamics process, again, a uh, participatory system dynamics process to look at uh, what policies might be most effective. Uh, and um, we were able to uh, understand that this combination of undertaking monitoring in the dwellings, raising public awareness and providing funds provided this virtuous circle um, of feedback, which uh, seemed to be very promising. Uh, set of policies to uh, introduce in Nairobi to address these, this critical issue of household air pollution in the slums there. We had some associated work in the Lancet countdown and we continue to publish in that uh, year by year, uh, trying to uh, understand the connections between uh, the move to cleaner fuels and the impact on greenhouse gas emissions and health. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have uh, uh, very much time now to go through in detail on this third example, but I just wanted to uh, flag this example up as a, an, something which is important in, in certainly in the UK context, uh, context uh, overheating in care homes because of the vulnerability of these older people in care homes. And we've, uh, I'll skip through a few of the slides. We uh, undertook a whole series of, of simulations uh, alongside monitoring work in care homes to understand what the impact of these different interventions uh, might be on reducing overheating during summer periods in care homes and therefore trying to improve the environmental conditions in these buildings and reduce the chances of people dying in these care homes during hot periods in the summer. So we uh, have just published, um, if you're interested in this paper, I, I, can, I can let you have it, um, uh, a first piece of work to look at the cost benefit of these type of uh, interventions. And uh, this is the kind of outputs from that work. We use a series of uh, weather files uh, to drive building thermal simulation models to uh, try to understand what the impact of these interventions were. In this case, it was shading devices placed on the facade of the buildings. Uh, and we use different types of life tables to understand the sensitivity of these simulations to those assumptions. But essentially, we were able to demonstrate quite significant um, savings. This is for one particular care home with 50 residents for one year. So these are the savings in pounds for one year, which uh, arise because people's lives are extended due to these interventions. And uh, in, the, in the UK, uh, the, uh, the value, valuation of a quality adjusted life year quality is £30,000. And using that information, we were able to demonstrate there were quite substantial savings, even on this relatively crude cost benefit analysis, and that therefore the interventions, which cost around £20,000 and would last 20 years maybe, uh, it was cost uh, effective um, in, in, in these uh, circumstances. So this uh, is of interest to uh, the Department of Health and Social Care in the UK, and we're beginning to work with them now to uh, try to understand what the implications of this work uh, might be. And use again, using systems thinking to try to uh, help move the care homes in the UK from this situation where they are currently overheating into a set of care homes that um, via adaptation actions are much more resilient to uh, the threats of climate change in relation to uh, heat. Uh, I think uh, I'm almost uh, at the end of my uh, time now. Uh, I just very quickly wanted to flag up um, some work uh, that we've been doing, if I'll just flick through. 
uh, for the last uh, two or three slides. Uh, we've been using system dynamics uh, throughout the process, as I've been trying to emphasize in my presentation. And uh, we've actually now, uh, a colleague Nikki Zimmerman, who I think some of you uh, may know, uh, has actually used system dynamics to simulate the CUSH program theory to try to understand how quickly it might be that a project like CUSH could actually have uh, impact. So I just thought you might be interested to see a couple of slides on that. There's the action model, which I showed up earlier, and these different connections bet between it. Again, I won't go through it in, uh, in detail again. But essentially, Nikki has built a system dynamics model of this program theory of the project and building in the time it takes for each of these processes to happen. So the time to build relationships for Apple, the, the time to agree city objectives, et cetera. And then she's built a model and this is the, the outcome of that uh, uh, quantitative system dynamics model. And it demonstrates that if we are to get to this point where implementation actually starts to happen, it can take a very, very long time to do that. And um, we need to be aware of that in trying to design projects like Kush to try to understand where the most effective places are to refine the way that these projects work. And these uh, are examples of how sensitive that time to achieve this information are to these different components within the project. And we can see there is, it's very sensitive to the time taken to build reset relationships, for example, and the, the time to plan and the time to develop strategy. I haven't got time to go into that detail now, but I just thought you might be interested in this bit of work that we're doing to try to understand how perhaps how to better design projects. Uh, such as as Kush. I'm just going to go to the end there to remind you really that our hope is via these actions that we've we are undertaking in the Kush project that via those actions we expect to contribute to change and see that change in changes in people in the cities that we're working with, the changes in processes in the city, and also changes therefore in the policy practice and research that takes place in those cities. Thank you very much indeed for your attention and again the kind invitation to uh, present to you today. So I'll uh, I'll stop sharing at that point. Thank you. Thank you professor. Thank you so much for your strong presentation. And now we will have 10 minutes for uh, questions and uh, everyone can type your questions in the chat box or just uh, unmute yourself to ask. And first, uh, I see that there is a question from Professor Wang. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Michael, for this uh, very interesting research. Uh, you introduced so many exciting projects. Uh, my question is about uh, how to validate our result because I feel uh, this kind of uh, policy related research, they are based on lots of assumptions. Some of them are quantitative, some of them might be semi-quantitative. So how can you validate, I mean, uh, because the system is so complicated and uh, you, it's really difficult for us to, real, uh, to really implement uh, or conduct some experiments to implement those measures. So therefore, how can you validate your results uh, to say it is reasonable or, or to, uh, based on the validation to adjust your assumptions? Thank you very much. That, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And it's definitely something that we've been grappling with and uh, trying to address within the Kush project. Um, there are various ways in which we can move towards that validation. So when you have the qualitative causal maps, so the, the qualitative uh, stages, um, we are bringing in these experts in each of the areas who um, both develop these causal maps, but then we, it, we, it's a very iterative process uh, and after a whole series of workshops, we ask them as experts to give their opinion of the models. So there is some kind of expert validation of the, the qualitative approach. So which is there anything missing in these causal maps? Is there anything there which shouldn't be there? Are the connections in the right place? Is the strength of the connections correct? So this is a kind of initial stage of trying to qualitatively um, validate the, the overall structure of these, system, uh, these systems models. Um, and it might be that in some cases, that's as far as we go. We, we build the, this uh, qualitative uh, set of connections, and that's been a useful process for the stakeholders involved to better understand the system. But as I mentioned, where we believe that the data, where robust and reliable data exists, then we can move on to the next stage to build a quantitative model, which can require different ways of validating. So that will uh, usually entails us uh, building the model and then running it for periods 
uh, leading up to the present day where we have data. So we can see, does, does, does the model broadly uh, coin, give outputs which coincide with the historical data? And so it, it gives us some confidence, not full confidence, because it's right to acknowledge that there is definitely uncertainty in these models, of course. But I think with uh, appropriate combinations of expert input and comparisons with historical data, it is possible to gain some degree of confidence so that you may be able to feel that these models, they're not perfect, but I, I believe that they can, if, you, if they're done in a very rigorous and careful way, can give very useful insights into the system and enable you to test these different policy options against multiple criteria. So yeah, it's a, it's a great question, a very important issue, and uh, one which we do try to address in the papers that we've published, and also in our conversations with policymakers to stress the uncertainty associated with them, albeit hopefully uh, via these useful models. Thank you. Professor, there's a question in the chat box uh, from Zoe. He asked about the availability of your overheating paper. Yes, I would be very, very pleased to, to do that. Yes, it's, uh, it was published a, a few months ago, so it's, uh, it's publicly available, I, I, and I'll be very happy to, uh, to send that to, uh, to you. I can see your address there, so yeah, thank you very much for that. And uh, I should say that that's, um, there are, there are a whole series of publications in, in that project. The project's called Climate Care. Uh, that project's largely uh, funded by the Research Council NERC in the UK, but we, um, I, I'd lead that project, but we, we, we have uh, the two projects have collaborated uh, in, in bringing some input from Push to that project as well. Um, so yeah, there's a whole series of papers from the, the Climate Care project. And the work I mentioned there is really the first in a series of papers that we're undertaking to try to assess uh, the cost uh, the, the benefits cost ratio of these interventions, but also trying to look more widely. That's a very and stark treatment of uh, mortality. Uh, and, and there are wider issues relating to morbidity, the comfort of the residents of these care settings, but also uh, maybe kind of broader societal issues of who pays for these interventions, who should pay, who benefits, uh, and these kind of wider um, issues beyond that very stark cost benefit analysis, which I um, described. Uh, in, in the presentation. Yes, Professor. Uh, another question um, by Linda was about uh, complex systems. Uh, she asked, have you had the opportunity to map a topic with IDEF0 functional modeling method? And uh, is there any limits? Uh, we, haven't, uh, we, we haven't done that within the CUSH project so far. I'd be very pleased to uh, put you in contact, uh, maybe you already know uh, Nikki uh, and others, but with the system dynamics team within Cush, uh, and I'm sure they'd, they'd be very pleased to engage with you and uh, to look if there were, you know, what the, the opportunities for that were. But no, we, ha we haven't done we haven't done that yet. I think we still have time for more questions. Okay, I will ask a question. Uh, I'm Yingping Zhao. Nice to. Uh, you give a nice, very nice uh, uh, presentation. My question is that for the pandemic control, different country, different city has different control policy. Can you use your model uh, approach to estimate the overall effect for different policy on the society, on the economic? That's all, thanks. Thank you uh, very much for the very interesting question. Um, I think I would answer that yes, I, in, in principle, I think the this system dynamics approach, the participatory uh, system dynamics approach would be you know, one method and one approach for addressing that really important um, issue. So in principle, yes, it's not something that we have done within the CUSH project. Uh, and whilst we do have some relevant expertise in the CUSH project, it wouldn't be necessarily something that we would be doing uh, between now and the end of the project. But I, uh, yes, I, in principle, I think this uh, bringing a systems thinking approach to that really critical issue where there are so many different parts of the uh, the system uh, is really vital. So, uh, and system dynamics would be a technique for allowing you to do that. And, uh, but no, within the CUSH project, we haven't done that as yet, but uh, I, would, I would suggest that it is a technique for trying to better understand these multiple connections and the impact of that and trying to design policies, as I said, which stand the best chance of success, success but also try to maximize core benefits and minimize unintended consequences. 
Um, Astra, uh, do you have a question? You can mute, your, uh, mute yourself. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Esther Akurul from Oxford Brookes University. Uh, mm. Michael, I'm really impressed by your presentation, but my, my question to you is, have you got any plans in terms of taking the system dy systems dynamic approach uh, at the policy level to the implementation level? Because at least within the UK, within the built environment sector, uh, most of these policies are implemented through the private market which doesn't, at least currently, and that doesn't necessarily serve all the time the, the purposes of social good. So I'd be very interested in talking to you a bit, a bit further about this, obviously beyond this conversation, but I just thought whether you had any plans to take that project at that le to that level of implementation. No, thank you. You know that's a great, great question, and I'd be I'd be very pleased to talk talk about it more more with you. So please do get in contact, and uh, you know I'd be I should I don't know if you it's, it's it's a big university I know, but I don't know if you know uh, Rajat Gupta at Oxford Brooks. I we work we work yes. with him closely. Yes, so I, uh, I in, work I work with Rajat. Uh, I co lead our Sustainable and Resilient Futures Research Network. Oh, great. Okay. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, as an, yeah, I think it's a great point and I, I, you make. And I, I, as, as an example, in that climate care project that Rajat is obviously involved in as well, um, we, we are working now with the Department of Health and Social Care, for example, and bringing that kind of systems thinking into. And, and I'm, I think in uh, a few weeks' time, I'm presenting to the Cross Whitehall Group. Uh, for overheating in buildings to try to talk about this approach that we the systems uh, approach in part so yes uh, you know a a mechanism for addressing this could be via um changes to uh, the approved documents for the building regulations for example and have something in there for social care which is rather more specific and tailored so yeah i think there are there are definitely opportunities to do that and to to be able to provide the evidence base that government would need to make those changes to the to the, to the regulations so yeah thank you and, and and please do get in contact I, I, it would be great to have a chat with you about that Okay, thank you. I will be in touch. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any more questions? Okay, I think that's it. Professor, once again, I want to thanks for your interesting talks and uh, thanks to all the questions from the audience.